earlier I picked up on as well and I really liked is that let's have a look at it from a separation to art, classical art and design. Because design thinking isn't always really design because it's a lot about process and, and research and those kind of aspects and listening. Um, but for me, therefore, problem solving is sort of nearly the bigger picture here. And he talks a lot about that. And I think that's what we can see a lot of organizations want now and need now. They say we need problem solvers. And when you start to talk about problem solving, it's quite interesting because then you say, well, it is you got to be creative about problem solving, right? So that means that's the level of creativity. You don't need to be a designer who can draw. It's not even relevant. It's not really required. Just like in order to deal with technology, you don't need to be able to code. And uh, But this, this kind of problem solving, being able to come up with, as he said, back when we were children, that what we want to tap back into, you know? And so that problem solving skill through a creative approach is what I really liked as a takeaway. Um, that we talked quite energetically about, I must say, in this particular interview. Is that a creative way to say that we should stop talking and go to the interview? For sure. That's, an, that's a first. So let's better do that then. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So this episode, we have Nir Bashan here. Uh, uh, welcome, Nir, and thank you for making time for us. Thanks for having me, Marcus and Troy. I am very excited to be here. Lovely. And I know you're dialing in from uh, Florida today. So tell us a little bit about yourself and why did you write the book? Yeah, so, um, you know, my history has been really interesting. Uh, I started really my professional career working in recording studios all over Los Angeles. And I worked with amazing musicians like, uh, you know, Rod Stewart and hip hop musicians like KRS-One. And you guys remember Cypress Hill? You remember those guys? I remember KRS-One as well. <laughs> yeah, there we go. You guys are real hip hop. Um, A little bit, yeah. Anyway, so I worked with all these famous people and I noticed that really there's two kinds of creative people in the world. There's the people who wait for lightning to strike. And then there's the people who are able to be creative at the drop of a, of a hat. And I was like, wow, these people are amazing, you know? Um, but it turns out that, you know, these famous musicians, and then I worked in Hollywood, right? And I learned that these famous actors are not that much different than us. They just have an ability to sort of create and make creativity whenever they wanted to. And I was like, damn, I got to find out more about that. And that started a lifelong journey of trying to understand how to manufacture creativity, no matter what business you're in. And that led to me writing the book. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting you say manufacture creativity. Is it manufacturing it or is it accessing it? You know, it is manufacturing it. And it's a really good question, uh, Troy. It's spoken like a true Missouri-born you red blooded <laughs> American. Um, basically, <laughs> basically, creativity is a tool just like anything else, right? So, you learn how to drive a car, you learn how to swing a golf club, you can also learn how to be creative. And I talk in the book about the how of creativity, not about the why. For me, it is you know, the why is whatever, I don't care, I want actionable tools. I, you know, the why is cool, I, I don't, I don't want to like, you know you know, knock the why too much. I'm, I'm all about the philosophy and stuff like that. But for like 10 pages tops, dude, like I need actionable items that I can use every day in my business and actionable items that I can use to make creativity. And that's, um, that's sort of what I came up with. It's a recipe of how to enact creativity. And yeah, it's, it's definitely manufacturing. It's sitting your ass in a chair and getting it done. Yeah. Very, wow, very it's like, by the way, are we, are we suddenly in the big Lebowski? You just called us dude. Yes. Is that your favorite movie? <laughs> it favorite is a favorite movie of movie. all time. But, but living in the UK, very few people ever call me dude. So I love no? it. Well, but a lot of people know the movie, you know, I'm about to make a white Russian right here right now. I wouldn't there we go. For that one. Plus, it's, plus it's five o'clock. So why not? Right. Um, so the other part you talk about right in the beginning of the book as well is that you mention logic as well as sort of a bit of a opposite potentially to it. So there's a lot of logic in business, you say, 
and that doesn't always work and sort of that creativity sort of sits a bit beyond that on a different space can you can you comment on that a little bit yeah definitely so for me it's not about throwing away the analytics the logic and that sort of thing it's about marrying it with creativity so we have institutions all over the world and i talk about it quite a bit in the book and you know researched it pretty well it's um it's a McGraw Hill release and, you know, McGraw Hill has been in business for almost 150 years. So they, you know, you can't put out trash. You got to like, everything's got to be triple checked. And so, um, so basically the argument I make in the book is that the institutions around the world, school, society, different sort of constructs have been set up to take us away from creativity and take us, you know, toward more analytics and, uh, spreadsheet logic and that type of thinking. And unless we're able to combine that with creativity, we look around and we see where the world is at. Um, very, the most, the majority of businesses today are not creative and look around, look, look in London, look at all the, you know, every enterprise that's going on over there. Um, and you will see that we are, completely lacking in our full potential of realizing enterprise. We just are, um, you know, businesses are struggling all over the world, uh, especially now with COVID, you know, people got hit and don't know what to do with themselves and don't know what to do with their product or their company or their careers. And the thing is, they don't know what to do because they've ignored, you know, one full portion of the mind that's supposed to help you when things go wrong and they're supposed to help you when things change. And so I'm on a mission, um, guys, Troy, Marcus, I'm on a mission to change the dialogue around the world about what creativity can really do for enterprise and business and how, how severely we, we need it and how, how much it's been lacking. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective. I think creativity, and I'm going to be kind of controversial, I think, um, is almost kind of, you say, bred out of people because we're trying to do conformity. We're trying to do reliability. We're trying to do consistency. And creativity is too much variability. There are too many unknown things that might happen if you are suddenly creative in, in how you do your job, whether that's sweeping the floors or doing your accounting or whatever. Like creativity, you know, it's interesting, but don't don't go too much because because you'll break the machine. Yeah. So yep. when you when when you look at that, and uh, when I expand that a little bit to saying, it's a bit of a maybe it's a bit of a dark art at times, right? And um, so I used to work for both the creative industry and advertising and, and, and art and whatnot. And when you do that, it is quite it can be a famously chaotic process that is hard to predict hard to predict when it sort of really hits and those kind of things whereas sometimes you might say that logic brings you more likely there but even cookie cutter recipes don't as you just stated so there's obviously plenty of universities and colleges there that teach creative things and there's a lot of creative people around and um, there's to some extent, designers in companies. Um, for example, IBM over the last few years worldwide hired 4,000 designers, UX, service design, and so on. So they're taking it on. And I know they're struggling because designers don't know enough about business. But what, from your perspective, is sort of really happening? Because the people are sort of there. The people who have already been tr properly trained at it for years are there. And the people who are sitting in companies could probably be trained for a few days. And I've seen that we did that over at BT quite successfully to turn engineers into creative, into design thinkers. But where, where do you think it's sort of happening? Where, where's the gap and why is there a gap that, that businesses seem to have a really, really hard time to be okay with that? So I think that, I think it's important to differentiate between art and creativity. Okay. So art is, one percent if you if you imagine a pie chart in your in your mind right creativity is a hundred percent of that pie chart take one percent of it it's a little sliver out and let's call that art music sculpture painting everything that we traditionally think of as art okay um so what we have is is a very stark difference between creativity and art for me, creativity is something that we were all born with. 
And I talk about it in the book where, you know, some of our earliest problem solving skills when we're babies, even before language develops, you guys, we're able to solve things creatively. When a baby wants a, a Cheerio in a in a uh, bottle, you know, and the bottle is uh, upside down or whatever, and it's got a cap on it, they can't say, take off the cap, I want the Cheerio. So, you know, they shake it around, they look for a hole, they flip it over, they unscrew the cap, they find a way to get to that Cheerio in a way that is completely original to human beings. It's, it's really an amazing thing. So I think it's really important to differentiate between art and, and, uh, and creativity. And just because you're hiring a bunch of designers, doesn't mean that you're, you're solving the problem. Listen, I've consulted with, you know, fortune 100 companies and the gut is always near, this is going to be great, but just hire it out. Um, and I respect that, you know, I'm there cause they've hired it out. But, you know, at a certain point, I have to tell leadership that, um, you know, that's really not possible. The, the revolution, the, the creative revolution needs to start within. It needs to be part and parcel to the organization throughout the entire pipeline. We can't just hire it out. We can't just say that we bought in some UI, UX people and look at us, we're creative. Yeah, that portion might be creative, um, but... You know, I also know a lot of designers. I, I worked in advertising for years. I've run, you know, multi-million dollar accounts on advertising agencies, some some of them into the half billion dollar level. And I've seen some of the quote unquote creative people that couldn't come up with an idea to save their lives. They had a repertoire of three ideas in their back pocket that they kept using with different shades of stuff. It, well, that's not real creativity. That's just, you know, that's just uh, kind of imposturing and, and repetition. So the creativity that I am a proponent of is the creativity that is part and parcel to our DNA. It's who we are as human beings and being able to tap into that um, construct and use it to solve problems, especially in business, is sort of where I focus most of my time. And I, I think that's that's interesting when you talk about the leadership sometimes needs a bit of a wake-up call saying there are some things you can outsource and there are some things you can't. But what's the driver? Is the driver that the leadership or the enterprise or the the culture says, we're not good at creativity, so we'll outsource it, or I'm not creative and so neither is anybody else, or I'm not creative enough, or what's the fear, what's the objection that, that prevents them from embracing more creativity internally? So mainly the fear comes from um, feeling that they are not creative because they, uh, you know, they think that I am going to come in and say, hey, let's buy an expensive piece of machinery and that will solve our creativity problem. Or, you know, we need to hire that really great creative kid who, you know, went to art school and knows how to, you know, paint. So he, he can help us solve problems differently. It's really about sort of relearning our approach to problems and understanding that the toolkit of the analytics of looking at a PL sheet you know, um, looking at a resume before we hire somebody, it's just not enough. It's just not enough. It'll never be enough, you guys. Listen, I did some research on you, Troy and Marcus. You guys are, you know, you guys have established uh, careers. You guys are entrepreneurial, uh, you know, have been owners of several companies, so on and so forth, right? And you guys both very well know. Let, let's look at hiring. I, I don't know. I'm just pulling something out of the air. And how many people have you hired in your career where you looked at their resume and you were like, this resume is bang on, right? This person's going to be so good. Like, this is going to be so great. I, I mean, it's just perfect. And then you hire them and like six months later, you're like, what was I thinking? I mean, how many mm. times has that happened to you? If, if you're being honest, if, if you ask me that it's happened to me so many times, it's embarrassing. Like I, I thought, oh, dude, I know how to hire people. I'm the best at this and blah, blah, blah. And I'd hire people and they'd be good for a little while. But then I'd be like, how did I miss that? You know? And so I don't know if you're if you're really honest with yourself and you look at stuff like this, I think that you fall into the same traps. And those traps are because there's soft skills. There's the approach to problems. There's, you know. Uh, uh, the sort of the unspoken um, essence of presence of being quiet and not talking a lot, the, you know, the way that a person, um, you know, 
their history and how they they approach a problem is priceless. And for me, that's more valuable than what's on the resume, right? But we don't hire on that because it's not analytical. We hire on, oh, what's on the resume? Three years here, four years there, three months here. Up, oh, got a promotion. Yep, 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 yep. Everything checks out. And I've done that my whole life. And I keep hitting wall after wall. And I've noticed that, you know what, there's got to be a better way. And, and six years ago, I sat down to write this book and collected the best of the best of what I've seen out in the business from Hollywood all the way to you know, I owned a furniture refinishing uh, business for a long time. I learned a bunch of stuff there, and I combined knowledge from a bunch of different fields on why we are consistently coming up short. And for me, that gap always was creativity. What do you guys think? Well, I, I've definitely made a number of kind of assessments based on the CV or based on the resume. But even when they came in for the interview itself, I was like, okay, what's written on the paper here doesn't match the person sitting in front of me. Yep. Um, I've made some other decisions that actually were, okay, okay it's all jiving up, so we're going to go ahead with this. And as you say, it was indeed the, the wrong hire. I think a lot of people, myself included, are looking to de-risk things and looking for other outside evidence and not following our gut enough in, in understanding and doing the interview. And, and that's always a a real challenge. So you're, you're right. You need creative, but how do you interview for creativity? Yeah. yeah. For sure. Go ahead, Marcus. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I could, I could, I could tell a couple of stories here too. I'll probably try just one for now, but um, you know, we had big projects where we didn't just need, so let, let's talk both about big projects that are transformative where you have to be quite creative about a lot of things because you're trying to change things and the things that are that you actually need are likely not there in the way you need them. Same with startups, right? You need to think on your feet. And, and I think problem solving is probably the thing that you brought up now a few times in some sentences that seems to me nearly more important than creativity because it seems to be part of problem solving right problem solving is sort of a bit bigger box of sorts and the interesting part here is that um you know i like to go back and look at the way the industrial revolution factories were built where people were de-skilled right so yeah. i don't want to know all the 20 things you know i want to know that one thing that's what i hired you for and you're going to do that for the rest of your life right here <laughs> in this particular spot right yep. and that's still how we build organizations and my hypothesis is and there's probably a lot of evidence there that's still why the CVs look like the CVs look like. If you do something for about five years straight and just that thing, oddly enough, you get promoted, you're going to become successful in a business. But in a business that d doesn't have any creativity there because it doesn't want to. So um, what I've seen a lot is then when you hire for projects like that, be it a startup or be a big transformation, you need a particular type of people. It's a little bit what Troy was talking about. You basically don't just need a developer. You don't just need a creator. You don't just need something else. You need someone who can think on their feet, can look between the gaps, can combine things, can 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 look for new tools and then bring them in and use them and, and just just you know do what's needed rather than do what's in the CV or what's in the brief description, right? Get the outcome no matter what. Very few people are educated like that. Very few people are hired like that so a lot of people start and go well if that's not how i'm getting hired then i'm just going to specialize on one thing i become this one trick pony because that's what everyone asked me to do right so i've seen very young people being absolute being being absolutely put in there and being successfully hired based on such a thing so i'm not surprised that what you're saying is people are really hard to find like that because they're basically told not to be like that and i find that a big problem yeah, definitely. I, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it's the uh, cart before the horse, right? It's like, wh what kind of started this issue from happening? And, you know, how did we get so hyper specialized in, in different things? And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think that, you know, understanding, understanding how to begin to look at hiring. I just did an article for recruiter.com. It's got, I don't know, it's one of the most, uh, you know, popular articles in, on their website. It was like a week ago that it was published and, you know, got shared all over. And basically I talk about 
stopping to look at the resume and starting to look at other things for um, for finding good people. And it's all the stuff that I've gotten wrong uh, and a few things that I've gotten right. So one of the things that I like is hiring military people. So when you hire out of, you know, the armed forces, especially the American one, is that you get, you know, miles and miles of discipline of the ability to, you know, look at a problem and follow through with it, you know, a sort of a missionized approach to a particular problem, which works really well in business. And so, you know, it's one of the things that I recommended that people sort of think outside the box creatively and hire somebody that is, you know, in the military. I also find that military people really love creativity because they are so damn analytical and everything in the military re relies on, you know, that clockwork precision of analytics. Um, I showed the book to, you know, General uh, Stanley McChrystal and some of the, um, you know, really uh, famous generals here. Uh, um, the guy who runs uh, um the uh, U.S. Air Force uh, uh, Academy, and they were like, oh, dude, we need this kind of thing because this is opening our mind to think in a bit of a different path. And even people that have ensconced that sense of analytics are starting to now believe that the world is changing and that the economy is no longer, Marcus, I do A and I get B. Um, I do B and then I get C. The economy has changed into like, I do A and maybe I'll get F. And then if I get F, then maybe it'll lead to B and then B will lead to, you know, G. I'm a consultant, right? So I put out, uh, I do a lot of content material like podcasts and TV and radio interviews and stuff like that. Um, those aren't A to B sort of relationships. I'm not out there and then, you know, the phone rings uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm pitching a, a, an engagement. These are all nonlinear things that bring in work. And I think more and more we're going to see the economy shifting toward that type of model where an employee coming in for a job is no longer going to apply for a position per se, but they're going to sort of be involved with a group or have followed them on social and have some relationship to that product or service, so on and so forth. I'll give you one good example, if, if you guys will let me. Um, I've, I've been a Porsche affectionado for many years. I've owned almost every one of their cars uh, at some point or another. And they sent me an email the other day. They said, dude, are you still in L.A.? I said, no. Uh, why? They're like, oh, we got a great model, right? We're not going to sell you a car anymore. I'm like, what? What are you, what are you talking about? And they, you know, I was back and forth with the, with the person there. And basically, there's a new program, guys, where you are able to put a certain amount of monthly payment and you can drive whatever you want. You call the dealer. They come to your house. They swap out the cars. And that's it. They even pay your insurance. You just pay the fee. They take care of everything else. The world is changing. The opportunities for creativity are right there and they're ripe for the taking. The way that an employee engages with an employer has completely changed. And we need to embrace those different opportunities and learn how to sort of keep up with what's going on today. Right, I want to pick up on two different things. You were talking about hiring the military. So back when I was growing up, there was a TV program that I'm sure you remember, which was called MASH. Yep. And, you know, Radar O'Reilly, you know, he got creative. Corporal Klinger, he got creative. And some of those doctors, they had to get creative because they were, you were know, at war in a situation where they needed creativity every single day just to survive and to save yep. lives. And I always found that was really, really interesting. That as, as you say, as much regimented and disciplined as the military was, they had buckets and buckets of creativity. And the, the other thing that you said about employees no longer coming to fill a position, but to join an organization. Um, what do you think about Zappos and their experimentation with holacracy? Don't know enough about it to comment. So holacracy is indeed an idea that there is no kind of structured management. Everyone goes within the organization and does what needs to be done. They're not specifically hired to just sit in the accounting department. Every team is loosely structured and loosely organized. And I think that that kind of lends itself to an openness and a creativity. And the it's a, a, a randomly or a reforming, a constantly reforming organization 
And I think that's a, there's a lot of creativity that can be possible there. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's one model, you know, um, and, and, and there's several, several others. Uh, yeah. I, I really think that, you know, this is really one of the most exciting times to be alive guys. I mean, if you, if you look at history in, you study the condition of humanity. We've never had it better. And I know it seems weird to say that during the middle of a, of a crisis. Right. Um, but it's true. I mean, there are people born today that are working, um, you know, not born today, but are working today that were born, you know, what, uh, 18, 20, 25 years ago that have never experienced any hardships in their entire lives. It's crazy to me, you know, um, they, they just have never experienced what it's like to struggle, what it's like to go through, you know, uh, what our, my grandparents went through, you know, World War II and, you know, having to, you know, flee uh, um, Poland because the Nazis have invaded and then the Soviets invaded. I mean, you know, that kind of horror is not something that we see today. We just don't know how to do it. And we assume that because we have, you know, we have it so good that we have, you know, oh, you know, this COVID thing hits and, oh, this is the worst thing on earth. It's not the worst thing on earth. It's not time to give up. It's time to fight. It's time to roll up your sleeves and start to think a little bit differently than everyone else is thinking. And that's kind of my my whole mission in life. And I would love people to do that. But all I get all day long is, when are things going to go back to normal? So there's a huge <laughs> yeah. to change as opposed to what you're suggesting, which I love, which is embracing creativity and looking for different answers and looking for different solutions. Yeah, that's the that's what you got to do um, today, especially. And you know, um, I've seen even just small businesses adapt to this stuff creatively. It's not rocket science, but it is getting uncomfortable and it is taking a risk on changing the paradigm. We are so busy trying to hedge our bets, you guys, and trying to do low risk activity that what we end up doing is actually creating more risk for ourselves in doing that. The very principle of something having worked yesterday is absolutely no guarantee that it will work tomorrow. It seems so simple and almost, you know, uh, cliche to say, but it is amazing how many companies I've worked with uh, over the years who literally will assume that because something is the way it is, it will continue to be that. And these are the companies that got fleeced by COVID. And then there's companies that have not gotten fleeced by COVID that are doing pretty good now. Um, and I look at them and I say, well, why are those companies doing good? It's because they've already started to embed creativity in the organization. And creativity allows for change to be more palatable. It allows for change to be more embraceable. I think there's a really great, great notion there because I think it goes, it gets us to a very favorite theme of ours, which is all about failure, right? And the interesting aspect there is the idea that, you know, wherever you go, there always will be risk, right? Just that the thing you're already familiar with seems, and there's a bias for that in behavioral science that says, the thing you're familiar with gives you the idea that there's less risk there, even so it's absolutely not true whereas if you go to the new space of something you don't quite know what it is it's always perceived as more risk and that makes a lot of organizations and groups of people averse of risk yeah the really interest now the really interesting part there I, i'd like to ask is then and i'm just gonna quote here a little bit which is uh, someone uh, i think at some conference said once you know ideas Ideas are like assholes. Everyone's got one, right? So the question here is, of course, and most of them say, stink. Yeah. So so that's that's then the device effector, right? We know, and uh, you worked in the creative uh, sector. I worked in the creative sector. That ninety eight percent of those things will not work out. But those two percent, then, as some business books tell us, actually will produce forty percent of the future revenue because that's where things are going, right? So actually, there is evidence that this can work. However, when you are in a day-to-day -day business and 20 people you got in a meeting or in a workshop, whatever you call it, everyone comes up with their own idea. How do you prioritize? How do you deal with that? So let's say everyone gets creative. What do you do then? So here's the thing, right? I did a uh, keynote just before COVID hit to a bunch of real estate people, uh, like a, a national 
uh, the American Re- Real Estate Foundation. I, I can't remember. Anyway, um, I had this very issue come up, right? And, you know, the group was like, basically, um, no, 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 sorry. It was after, after the, the, the lecture. I had a lady come up to me and yeah, yeah, that's right. She came up to me and said, hey, Nir, you know, I have a bunch of ideas. Um, I have too many ideas. I have this idea and then I have that idea. And then I have like a bunch of ideas and, and ideas aren't the problem. I'm really creative. I said, okay, give me one of your ideas. She's like, okay, so um, on my listings, I write a story and blah, 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 blah. I don't, you know, uh, write that it has four bedrooms, three bathrooms. I write, you know, the stories that people can have there on the listing. I'm like, oh, cool. Okay, what else? She's like, so when I take photographs on the listing, I do blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, uh, what else? Just give me another uh, thing that you do. She's like, I'll give you a hundred. I'm like, okay, give me a hundred. So she's like, uh, on the listing and blah, 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 on the listing, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, okay. So we got to a point, Marcus, where every one of her ideas wasn't a genuine and new idea. It wasn't a fresh departure. She just had a bunch of executionary ideas. I talk in the book about the three stages of manufacturing creativity. One of them is the biggest stage, which is called the concept. That's the widest way to look at your company, uh, product or service, or even career. The medium view is the idea and the laser sharp, uh, you know, atom microscope uh, view is the um, execution. Okay. And what she was doing is she was busy looking at just the execution. It's where we spend most of our time in businesses, it's putting out fires, it's getting stuff done. And we sometimes don't even know why we're doing these particular things. We're just executing for execution's sake. And so she did not have a wide range of creativity. She just had manifestation after manifestation of the same idea, just slightly different. So what I asked her to do is I said, what are you in the business of? And she was like, I'm a real estate agent uh, for, for commercial and residential properties. I sell real estate. I'm like, yeah, that's your execution. What's your idea? What's the concept? And she had a lot of difficulty up leveling herself, but we talked, you know, for a few minutes and we found out, you know, that, um, you know, she was, uh, I, I can't remember the exact story, story, but it was something like, uh, she, you know, bounce around from home to home as a kid. And then her, you know, when she was nine, she remembers her parents buying a house and that changed her life forever because she finally felt secure. So I'm like, okay, maybe your particular concept is then security and your execute, your idea then becomes, you know, a manifestation of security, which is, you know, home, comfort, those types of things. And then your execution is, yes, what you do on the listing is special because you're getting certain uh, buyers to look at that. But I said, now, what can you look at in security and home and comfort that you can then tweak and come up with new ideas for your execution that aren't related to the listing? And she was like, mind blown, dude. She was like, whoa, okay. So what I need to do is start to think of my product or service in a much broader sense so that I don't have to spend my time in the details and the minutia, but then I can come up with ideas that will have their own details and minutia if they're properly flushed out. I'm like, totally go for it. And like she left and was really excited. So Marcus, to answer your question in a really long about way, um, I think that a lot of companies who think that they are creative um, are just bouncing those same ideas around over and over again with maybe just a slightly different spin. And w- one mm-hmm. of the things that I talk about with people to, to kind of pull up on that whole story, what you did, which I thought was really excellent of helping her move from selling a product to actually selling the value and the value being security is I tell people you have to express value as one or more of five things. How do you save me money, make me money, save time, add joy, or remove pain? Because that's what you're really kind of selling. That's the value you are delivering. Yep. And then how you're doing that may be through a house, it may be through a padlock, it may be through a password, or whatever that happens to be that's the actual kind of execution of that. And moving from the what we're selling to the, the why we're selling and the value we're creating. But moving on from from Marcus's point of, I've got in a room too many people with too many ideas, whether or not they are creative. 
to in a room where you've got nobody willing to do anything because they're afraid that they're going to look stupid. How do you help organizations or what can organizations do to move little experiments? We talk a lot about experiments and innovation and, and kind of digital transformation. What kind of little experiments can you do as an organization that allows people to embrace their creativity and to start doing it again in a safe way? So sometimes what I do with organizations is look at their history and in their history, what is end up being revealed, what sort of starts to come out, Troy is little victories. And what little victories are, is those breadcrumbs that happen along the way that are trying to guide you in where you need to perhaps go. We are so good analytically of picking that North Star and saying, we're going to get there or I'm going to die trying. You know, that whole sort of, you know, American cowboy sort of thing of, you know, keeping that North Star going. A lot of businesses get in this trap, not just American ones. We, we just kind of are really goal oriented. And unless we hit that main target, we feel like we've failed. But there are so many little victories that happen along the way that might be pointing us in a slightly different direction. And that slightly different direction is creativity. So in order to energize a group from thinking, hey, you know, we are either, you know, we're all, we're too creative. And then, you know, I sort of help them with the concept idea and execution. And when they feel like they're not creative at all, I say, let's look back a week. Let's look back two weeks and see what those little breadcrumbs are. There was a ice cream salesman many years ago who was a pretty good analytical thinker. He wanted to sell a bunch of ice cream machines. So he got sales lists, contacted people, and tried to you know sell a bunch of machines. It worked for a little while, but then he started to falter, um, just like every analytical business does. They start to falter when you don't combine creativity at some point, at some time. You know, they're not going to do well. So he noticed there was a restaurant that kept ordering machines because they were breaking. And so he went to this particular restaurant just to see what all the uh, what all the fuss was about. And he, you know, ended up standing in a in a line that was out the door around the block, finally got to the counter and then he had the best cheeseburger he's had in his entire life. And his name was Ray Kroc. And that restaurant was McDonald's. So if you're willing to let those little breadcrumbs and those little victories guide you, the goal might be better than selling a bunch of ice cream machines, which was the main North Star target. The goal then now became, you know, getting involved with the best hamburger, you know, that exists on earth. And that those little breadcrumbs led to a different path. And so I encourage organizations to start looking for little victories and to start loosening the load of having to get it right all the time of, oh, we got to make the right decision so we can get to that North Star. It's about loosening the load and looking around and looking at your successes. Because I guarantee you, if you're in business today and someone's paying you for something, there are some successes. But where are they really leading you? And is your ship steered towards the right target? I don't know. You might be worthwhile to look at those little victories and maybe make a bit of a course correction. Great story. Great story. That sounds great. Yeah, I think um, what I'd like to, because um, I'm just looking at the time, and as usual, we have too many questions and too little time, and it's all often as exciting as it is now. Um, so let me let me just bring maybe potentially a last question here. Um, there's a lot of times when companies talk about efficiency and not effectiveness. And efficiency goes a lot in all transformation projects. And, you know, there's a lot of money and millions being spent to do a stepping stone, to improve, to become more competitive. And then instead of really being more effective and stepping out there and trying something else to really improve the outcome, efficiency kicks in and that thinking. And then people just sort of polish the edges of the old machine. And that's everything that's that's getting done. Do you have? Uh, can you can you comment a little bit on sort of the differentiator you see between efficiency and effectiveness, and how much it plays into your your theme and model? Yeah, definitely. So it's a quality versus quantity sort of thing. Um, a lot of businesses, fa- you know, 
chase efficiency, but efficiency at what? Like, why are we getting, you know, 0.001% better at this particular um, manifestation? What is it really doing? And again, it's that race in execution. It's that view of working in the business instead of working on it. I consulted with a manufacturer who made machine grade parts, um, you know, uh, to very, very slight tolerances uh, for the military and for aviation, you know, parts that, that had to be like bang on, like, you know, to the thousandths of an inch or whatever, you know, the, uh, the highest sort of, you know, machining that they had to be made. And this was a company that initially bought me in to consult to help them get more efficient. And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. We could do it, but it's going to be in a creative way. And you might uncover something that you weren't expecting. They're like, yeah, cool. We, 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 we think we can get a, a good worth out of you coming in. So I said, okay. Um, so, you know, I, I, I sort of worked with them and they were like, so this machine here, blah, blah, blah. And I have three operators. These three operators had to go to school, certified program, blah, blah, blah. We have two machines in the entire world. One's right here and blah, blah, blah. It's really special. I was like, okay, what do y'all want to do? And they're like, well, we want to, we, we got to, so it's just, it's a laborious thing. And if we could shave like, you know, just a few minutes off the process, and if we can get more efficient, if we can get blah, blah, blah. I said, well, why do we want to shave a few minutes off the process? And they looked at me like I was an idiot, Marcus. They were like, dude, because are you kidding me? If you get, if you save two minutes a day near, then blah, blah, blah. And the analytics kick in right away. The, the P and L sheets, the, you know, the stuff that management is only looking at. They're not looking at the human side. They're not looking at the soft skills. They're like, we're able to save two minutes here. That'll add up to 26 minutes a month. That 26, you know, uh, 42 minutes. And then over the year, it's going to be, you know, a savings of blah, blah, blah. And I said, guys, when we're, this much in a detailed situation about an operator on a piece of machinery saving a certain amount of time, I think we're totally down the wrong rabbit hole. And someone at my price range does not need to be working on a problem like this. What y'all need to do is up level this conversation and start to look at what it is that you really want to do. If it is that you want to efficientize the the workforce, you know, so that it takes two minutes less here, maybe there's a, a better machine to do it on. Maybe there's an easier machine to do it on. Maybe there's a better way to do it on, uh, to do it and get it done. And maybe that we should talk to the staff and, you know, see what the union has to say about it, because maybe they have some ideas that they can come to the table with, so on and so forth. It really is about holistically looking at the neighborhood that that problem exists in and not hesitating, Marcus, to knock on all the doors in the neighborhood until we can awaken some type of solution. We are so good at lasering in on what we think is the problem, but often what that we think is the problem is incorrect or it got attention for some reason that it baffles the mind why this particular thing got attention and not the other 350 problems that this company had. And so what I was able to do is work with them on a very high level. And we were able to shift their identity from a manufacturer to a trust, a company that traded in trust because they had partners that none of them were less than like 15 years. I mean, they had long, long, long-term clients and they really were in the business of trust. And once we were able to establish that, the impetus of what it meant to be in a trust business spread from management all the way down to their interns and, you know, the, the machinists that were right out of school. And everybody sort of carried a new burden of responsibility that every single thing they did was a trust item for a customer because who knows, maybe your mom or dad or your family might be on that plane one day for that part that you made. And it revolutionized and changed the identity of the company where employees were able to come to work with purpose, with drive, with gravity. And all of that started with an efficiency issue over two minutes on a piece of machine. And what we ended up with was solving not only that problem, but really in capturing, um, in capturing a new modality of thinking. That sounds great. And really, it's a really exciting story. And uh, Thanks, I think man. it's a perfect moment to, to, to sort of 
wrap this with this. Uh, obviously, we could talk forever about stories and things, and it's really exciting to listen Before to we you. wrap it up, can we talk a little bit about football? Because, Marcus, I will tell you, just by the accent, <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a, lo- a little bit of a guess here. Just by the accent, I think that you're an Arsenal fan. Well, you found the one German that actually is not into football at all. Sorry to disappoint Whoa. you. <laughs> the, there's other sports in the world. Tori, what's up with that? <laughs> oh, uh, I, I have no idea. I think I'm a cultural alien, I guess, in this, uh, this uh, version. I'm more into, let's say, the U.S. sports of skateboarding, for example, which is a very different kind of way of dealing with you know, challenges, problems, and uh, sustainable failure, so to speak. And I enjoy that very much. Yeah. So that's me. Yeah, sorry about that. But uh, it was very exciting talking to you. Oh, hold on, hold on. If you're going to open the door, who are you supporting? I'm West Ham all the way, hammered for the league. I'm forever blowing bubbles. Right. I'm I'm a Chelsea guy. (laughs) Boo! (laughs) Boo! You're from Missouri and you're a Chelsea guy? That's so weird, Troy. I know, I know, I know. But anyway, we've opened the door. We're going to close the door. I'll hand back over to Marcus to wrap up the episode. guys. (laughs) Yes, so uh, as I said, thank you so much for your time. It was super exciting. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, that was fun. This was a fun one. Lovely. Okay, thank you. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-hosts Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.